Good evening, everyone, and very warm welcome to our webinar. I'm Maria Montague. I'm the Deputy Director of the Ukrainian Institute London, and we are a registered charity dedicated to broadening knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond through educational and cultural activities. We are solely funded by donations and by income from events. So we're very grateful to all of you for booking your tickets this evening, which allows us to hold at least some of our events free of charge. So tonight's webinar is the first um, of our very exciting new season, The Many Faces of Ukraine, celebrating Ukraine's diverse cultural heritage and exploring how different cultures have interacted in Ukraine historically. We're delighted to have a fantastic panel of experts this evening to discuss the works of Paul Salan and to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Salan's birth. The webinar tonight will be moderated by Uyum Blacker, who is Associate Professor in Comparative Russian and East European Culture at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, University College London. Uyum's research focuses on Ukrainian, Polish and Russian culture and cultural memory. He's the author of the book Memory, the City and the Legacy of World War II in East Central Europe, The Ghosts of Others, which came out last year. And you should be able to see the link uh, to the book in chat now. So, Uyam, thank you very much for moderating this evening. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Maria. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be participating in the first event in the new series on uh, the many faces of Ukraine, uh, about the rich cultural history of the lands that make up uh, contemporary Ukraine. I think this is a really uh, fascinating topic and one that's really, really uh, ripe for exploring and celebrating. So it's really exciting to see the Institute um, focusing on this. Uh, and I think there's no really no better place to start uh, the series with the work of Paul Celan, who's certainly one of the most uh, famous figures in world literature who comes out of the territories of uh, today's Ukraine. Uh, Celan was born in 1920 in what was then Chernauti in uh, Romania, um, also known as Chernovitz, uh, and today as Chernivtsi in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine, near to the Romanian border. Um, the city that Silan was born into was, like the region of Bukovina, highly ethnically linguistically diverse, uh, home to Germans, Jews, Romanians, Ukrainians, Poles, and others. Uh, and Silan came from a, a German-speaking Jewish family, but also uh, and was immersed in German language culture and literature, uh, but also attended Hebrew language school. Uh, and in his everyday life, he would have dealt with and encountered the Romanian language, Ukrainian, Yiddish, uh, and other languages. Uh, and he spoke and understood and worked with many of these languages in his life. Um, during the Nazi occupation of Bukovina, which uh, uh, Silan experienced as a young man, both of his parents were murdered in the Holocaust, and he himself spent time in a labor camp. After the war, he uh, left uh, Chernivtsi left Bukovina, lived briefly in Bucharest uh, before moving to France via Vienna. And he lived in France until his death by suicide in Paris in 1970. Uh, and Celan is really seen as, by many, as the greatest German language uh, poet of the 20th century, and generally as one of the, the greatest uh, poets of the 20th century, full stop. Uh, his work is uh, diverse, it's complex, it's very hard to uh, characterize it in a couple of words, but I hope we'll be able to, to get into his work a little bit this evening and we will hear some of his work uh, later on. Um, but he is very famous for his poetry, which reflects on the Holocaust and in many ways the destruction of that uh, multicultural uh, land from which he came. Uh, poetry which is uh, remarkable for the way in which it radically reinvents the German language after the war, the language of the perpetrator, as it were, uh, in order to speak about the crime on behalf of the victim. Um, his famous Holocaust poem, Todesfuge, uh, Death Fugue, was described by one of Celan's translators, John Felsteiner, as the Guernica of post-war European literature. And Felsteiner compared it to Wilfred Owen's Dolce et Decorum Est or uh, Yeats's Easter 1916 and its significance uh, for modern poetry. 
In Ukraine itself, uh, which is you know, the land of uh, Ceylon's birth, uh, his links with the country were relatively little known for a long time, although Ukrainian intellectuals, some leading Ukrainian intellectuals and poets like Mykola Bajan or Vasil Stus uh, knew his work and translated him into Ukrainian. Um, but in recent years, there's been a real upsurge in interest in Paul Sivan's work uh, in Ukraine more broadly and, and focused in uh, Chernivtsi itself, his, his home city, uh, which now hosts an annual festival, Meridian Chernovitz, uh, in his honor. Um, and we'll be speaking a little bit about uh, Silan in today's Ukraine uh, later on. So I'm really delighted to be able to introduce a really wonderful panel of speakers to talk about Silan uh, from various different perspectives. Um, our first speaker will be Anja Neumann. Uh, Anja is a, an affiliated lecturer in German at the University of Cambridge, Isaac Newton Research Fellow in Digital Humanities at the Centre for Research in the Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences in, in Cambridge. And she teaches modern German literature, visual culture and medical humanities. And in 2012, she completed her PhD on German literature at Queen Mary University of London uh, with a thesis on the poetry of Nellie Sachs and Paul Celan. And her book on, uh, based on her thesis, uh, Aesthetic Temporality in the Late Poetry of Nellie Sachs and Paul Celan was published in 2013. Uh, our second speaker will be Gael Fischer, a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Holocaust Studies, the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich, in Germany. Uh, she earned her PhD from University College London, so my former colleague, uh, in 2015, uh, with a thesis on the experiences of German speakers from Bukovina after the Second World War. And she's the author of Resettlers and Survivors, Bukovina and the Politics of Belonging in West Germany and Israel, 1945 to 1989. Uh, we also have on our panel Irina Vikirchak, who is a Ukrainian uh, cultural manager, literature promoter and author. Uh, she's worked as executive and program director for several literary organizations and festivals and as head of the Creative Europe program in Ukraine. Uh, she's also the author of three books of poetry, so uh, another uh, a poet to speak about a poet. And she's currently based in Wrocław in Poland, where she's working at the Wrocław House of Literature and also for the Nobel Laureate in Literature, Olga Tokarczuk. Uh, and she's also developing a doctoral thesis on the work of Rosa Auslander, uh, who is another writer who's very relevant to our uh, discussions. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Igor Pomerantsev. Igor is a poet, critic, playwright, a broadcaster who has worked for the BBC, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in London, Munich and Prague. Uh, and he's the author of radio plays and several books of prose, poetry and essays, including Radio, radio C, the book of radio stories published in 2002. Uh, and he is one of the founding members of Meridian Chernovitz International Poetry Festival and the Paul Silan Literature Centre in Chernivtsi. So I'm extremely pleased and delighted to have such a, a varied and well-qualified panel to speak about Paul Silan. Um, but I think I would like to come back to Silan in, in broad terms to talk about him as a writer, his significance for uh, modern European literature, German language literature. And that's where I'd like to start uh, with you, Anya. Mm -hmm. um, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a sense of Paul Celan's place in European literature, in German language uh, literature. Thank you. Sure, of course. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so, so you're asking me to introduce Paul Celan in the context of European literature and with regard to its place in post-1945. Um, post-1945 German speaking poetry and, and needless to say and you already gestured to that that um, that it's an impossible task um, to achieve in a few minutes um, but I would begin by proposing two distinct figures of movement or directions in Paul Zeeland's poetry and um, so allow me to go slightly off piece here and to take a detour. And I would like to use a prompt from contemporary German visual art. Um, and um, 
to exemplify the two figures of movement that are so characteristic for Ceylon's poetic language. And um, a couple of months ago, the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt reopened after substantial um, rebuilding work. And um, what you can see here on the slide is an aluminum sculpture by the Israeli artist Aria Schlesinger, which is located in the entrance area of the museum and placed between a 19th century building, which you can just about see on the right side, and the new postmodern building of the museum on the left. So Schlesinger's space intervention is composed of two trees. And what we can see here is a kind of mirror image. One of the trees is firmly rooted in the ground and a replica is flipped upside down with its roots pointing skywards. And so both tree figures are identical al aluminum cast, which, which Aria Schlesinger actually took from a real fig tree in, in Italy. So he traveled all the way, way to Italy to find his tree and to cast it into aluminum. So Schlesinger's tree sculptures is labeled untitled. And like Ceylon's poems, his double tree invites us to engage. Um, it, it's in a way, it's an invitation to a new kind of reading um, and to interpretation. And the artist intentionally left it open to interpretation. And the tree is a figure of growth and rootedness. And yet, if, if you look at it, um, um, we are seeing two skeletons here in a way. It's, it's bare of leaves. And the mirror image of the tree, however, complicates ideas about rootedness and homeland, which was so often exploited by the no, um, national socialists. So this upside down version of the tree can be related to a second generation uprooted by some cath catastrophic event and now landed on its mirror tree. And, and this is an impossible space we are seeing here the, with the roots in the air, a very precarious and inhospitable location where roots cannot take hold. And, and Ceylon would probably speak in this context about um, a very uncanny space. And yet the branches of both trees are intertwined. And, and this kind of embrace gives way to a more I would call it a recuperative reading, a more positive reading. Aria Schlesinger repeatedly uses a gesture and I'm trying to demonstrate it. And it's this kind of gesture of, of clasping hands to reenact the sculpture and that they really are entangled and coming together and intertwined. And, and this points me to another poetic gesture which Ceylon uses to characterize a poem as an event. When he says, and, and this is in his Prima Price speech, one of the few speeches he gave when he, he received um, two quite eminent prizes um, for his writing. So he said that a poem can be conceived as a handshake. Um, and in this way, a clasping of, hand, of hands across historical time and across the loss that occurred are contrasted with an uprooting of historical meaning. So Ceylon's poetry picks up both of these quite vibrant gestures, these gestures of connection and, and radical disruption. And in his address to the reader, his poem, In Der Luft, In the Air, it's a poem which was published 1963 in, in the volume of poem, um, Die Niemandsrose, um, The No One's Rose, and it's, it's the closing poem of this volume of poem. And um, I want to start with the two, or I want to um, introduce the first two lines of this poem because it's exemplary for this kind of openness and uprootedness. It, in a way it enacts the creation of a new language. I'm just reading it now. In der Luft, da bleibt deine Wurzel. Da, in der Luft. And the English version, in the air, that's where your root remains, there, in the air. So the image of the aerial root, um, another botanical illusion here, 
um, in the first two lines of the poem may stand in for the image of the tree as if your root is grasping something, again, this grasping movement, in a displaced world. And furthermore, the opening of the poem recalls the idiom up in the air. And in doing this repeatedly, um, it performatively creates a kind of um, cyclic structure, um, at least on a syntactical level. We, we have the in the air at the start and at the end. Um, of the first two lines, which prepares the ground for the following in which the text engages with the idea of the poem as a place of encounter. So three years earlier, before this, this poem was published in October 1960, when Ceylon was awarded the Büchner Prize, and, and this is the most prestigious award for writer in Germany, Ceylon developed the idea of a meridian in his acceptance speech. He described the circular movement as a connective, which, like the poem, needs to encounter um, crisscrossing historical time. And at this point, and I'm, I'm wary of the linear clock time, um, I would like to come back and, and to close by, by this, yeah, by the closely entangled branches, the clasping hands in Schlesinger's tree sculpture. And what I'm trying to suggest here um, is that the double tree tells us something about Zeeland's place in European literature and in the arts more broadly, I guess, and the unique way in which he approaches language. First, that his poems use and rely on the language which went through all the darkness and cruelties committed by the National Socialist. Um, so he, Zeeland was really engaging in the murderous speech of the National Socialist. And he engaged with the linguistic ground by bringing the German language back to its roots. He had really um, this poetics, which, which he called the, um, where he digged into the etymology of the words and engaged with that. Second, um, this created a radical strangeness of expression and tone. And this new way of speaking, often uttered through neologisms, or he was also cracking open words and by yeah, dispersing them between two lines. This new way of speaking generated an openness and the possibility of a new language. And I want to close um, with my final image here, uh, which really shows us another way of encounter or another place of encounter between Zeeland's poetry and a contemporary reader who, um, reacted to this openness. Um, and this, just to see it full image here, is Ansam Kiefer's Dein Goldnes Haar Margarete. And it's a painting which, which he um, painted in 1981. And it, in a way, we have this line from the death food, which Uliam already mentioned, um, the, the iconic um, um, Holocaust poem by Ceylan, um, Dein Goldenes Haar Margarete, which is transposed into the, the ground of, of Kiefer's poem, uh, Kiefer's painting. And in a way, what it shows us here is that Ceylan's legacy really is, is yeah, continued by, by other artists, be it poets or, or painters um, or translators indeed, by, yeah, by them engaging with his work and by continuing reading and writing his verse in different media. And, and I think I leave it here. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Anya, for this uh, really interesting uh, and unusual approach, I think, that to uh, Ceylan's work uh, and to his language and to his, his imagery. Um, I think we've got a really nice sense of that there. And also that it's so interesting the way that his work is kind of um, lives on in these in these artistic projects, and I think it really it's it's so um, so kind of resonant. Has so many so many uh, you know su such openness for interpretation that it's it's perfect for this kind of artistic um, elaboration. Um, so I'm sure we will come back to Silan's poetry, but I want to go back maybe to the uh, you know you spoke about the roots. I want to go back to the roots of Paul Silan, in a sense, and turn to Gael now, Gael Fisher and ask you about um, the environment which produced Paul Celan, which produced this uh, fascinating 
uh, writer, uh, this kind of multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, borderlands region, which um, obviously then uh, was drastically affected by the, the events of the middle of the 20th century, the, the Second World War uh, and uh, the Holocaust. So if, if you wouldn't mind saying a, a few words about that context. Yes, so um, of course, Ceylon is often uh, said to elude uh, categorization. And the fact that he was a, a German speaking Jew born in Romania from a country that was uh, then the Soviet Union and is now Ukraine has captured and still captures the imagination, especially for people like us who think often in terms of nation states. Um, in a program I was listening to on the radio recently, he was described as coming from nowhere. And um, I thought this was interesting because this is a depiction that he himself uh, very much cultivated by saying he came from an unknown landscape and describing Kuvina as the place where people and books lived so very abstractly. But I would argue that aside from his literary, dream, literary genius, um, his fate and experiences were actually relatively typical of that of a Jewish man from turnouts uh, of his class and generation. So it is, for instance, not so astonishing that Ceylon wrote in German and regarded German as his mother tongue, while also being, of course, proficient in a number of other languages. Uh, when he was born as Paul Anchel in 1920, Bukovina was already part of Romania. But for the whole of the interwar period, Bukovina's society retained significant traces of its having belonged for a century and a half to the multi-ethnic and multilingual Habsburg Empire, and more specifically to the Austrian half of that empire. So it was often described as the easternmost uh, uh, part of Habsburg Empire and, and a sort of German cultural outpost in this sense. Um, and German cultural assimilation among the province's Jews had developed under Habsburg rule due to the advantages it brought with it in terms of education, employment, and upward mobility. So by the turn of the 20th century, the region's Jewish minority, representing around 13% of the population overall, uh, but in particular Chernovitz's large urban emancipated Jewish population, who represented around a third of the city's residents, uh, was mostly German speaking and based even in the home. So they'd sort of switched from Yiddish to German by this point. Dominating trade and the professions, um, Jews also represented a large percentage of Bukovina's urban and cultural elite. So most of the newspapers, for example, were published in German by Jewish editors. And Ceylon's cultural identity, therefore, I think needs to be seen uh, against the backdrop of this specific social fabric of this imperial borderland, um, characterized by, as we've already heard, everyday encounters between different peoples and faiths and languages, but also by vibrant Jewish intellectual life and by identification with a German cultural nation, so Kulturnation. But of course, I mean, it's also key to understand Ceylon uh, in the post-imperial and post-World War I context into which he was born and um, when Bukovina was part of Romania. So some historians have described the continued use of German among Jews in interwar Bukovina as a form of resistant nostalgia. So a form of opposition to or rejection of the Romanian presence and the attendant idealization of Habsburg times. Um, it is true that under Romania's nationalizing and increasingly anti-Semitic interwar regime, the situation uh, for Jews and for other minorities in the region became increasingly precarious in this period. And the flourishing of the region's Jewish German language literature at this time associated with the names of Rosa Ausländer or Mar Alfred Margus Ferber, who are somewhat older than Ceylon, um, might itself be understood as a form of escapism. Um, at this time, many Bukovinian Jews also literally looked for a way out. 
And uh, over time, it became common for middle and upper class Jews from the region to search for opportunities abroad, um, be that in Palestine or elsewhere. And here again, I think Silan is a representative as he also left to study medicine in France in 1938. He was forced to return to the region due to the outbreak of World War II. And one can say that his experience of, of World War II and the Holocaust set him somewhat apart from the majority of Bukovina's Jews as two thirds of the pre-war community did not survive. He belonged to the approximately 17,000 Jews of Chernauts, around a third of the pre-war community who were able to avoid deportation to Transnistria by the Romanians. However, he did not avoid forced labor as we heard already and his parents were deported in June 1942 and both murdered after they ended up in territory under German control. Silan was then haunted his entire life by the fact that he had not managed to prevent this from happening. Um, finally, his post-war stations, so to speak, from Chernauts to Bucharest, where he worked as a translator in, in the immediate post-war, later to Vienna and to Paris, do distinguish him somewhat from uh, many other Bukovinian Jews and Holocaust survivors who, for the most part, uh, went to Palestine or Israel and or the United States. But like him, the, vice, the vast majority of these people left the region and they all, whether they left or not, shared his deep sense of uprooting and loss, uh, the irrecuperable loss of the social world's multi-ethnic, multilingual and very much Jewish Central European world in which he had grown up. It is to this loss that Silan managed with his unique charm and talent to give a voice, as we just heard, but also uh, it is that that gives, uh, gave him a sense of having come from nowhere. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I have a few images, but I don't know if I should show them now or later. Um, you could show them now if you like, yeah, for sure. So yeah, I chose this image as a sort of illustration for the social life and world um, of Bukovina. This is a few of the newspapers that were published in German um, before and after World War One by um, Jewish editors often. Um, and on the right, you see this sort of tradition of um, Jewish street photography or street photography, which many people would want to have their picture taken in, in um, nice uh, sort of modern fashion uh, on the main high street. And I think this sort of captures this sort of middle class Jewish social life. Um, it is something that Mariana Hirsch and Leo Spitzer have written about um, more at length. Um, also, I mean, interesting with this, de uh, with, by dealing with this street photography, um, Mariana Hirsch and Leo Spitzer, they also deal with the sort of contrasts uh, that were characteristic of, of Chernovitz, both of Bukovina um, as, a, as a region where they were sort of living side by side, very tr modern uh, elements and very traditional elements, but also sort of rich and poor, rural and urban. So sort of a, a region of contrast and a, um, a place of contrast in which Ceylon also grew up. Um, this I think is uh, interesting. It's the it's a translation by Paul Ceylon uh, when he was working in Bucharest right after the war. So he translated Chekhov's uh, short story, The Pe Peasants, into um, Romanian from Russian. And here you can see that he was still using the name Anche, so Romanian spelling. And obviously then he used the anagram uh, to rename himself Paul Tzina. Uh, and here is a also um, interesting document. It's, the, it's a, a sort of obituary that was published by the community of Bukovinian Jews in Israel after his suicide. And as you can see, this community uses German. So in Israel, they're publishing their newsletter in German. Um, but at the same time, I mean, this reminded me of, of uh, John Pez dinners. We've already heard about him. He's, his comment that Ceylon became a sort of um, 
contested uh, or contested commodity or that many people claimed him and I think this is representative of this community also claiming Ceylon as their um, their icon and their poet after the war. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for such a such a clear and interesting sort of survey of the of the contrasts and complexities of uh, Bukovina and Chenifti, and also yeah, really interesting to see this the kind of um, that the posthumous existence of Paul Ceylon um, in that last document. Um, so now I want to move on to Irina Vikarczak and move from the, the book of winner of the past into the book of winner of the, of the present, in Chernivtsi of the present. Um, and we heard a lot about the very interesting and rich, uh, complex uh, cultural heritage that uh, has come down essentially to uh, contemporary Chernivtsi and contemporary book of winner, but uh, perhaps has not always been uh, understood or recognized by the people who live there or people in Ukraine uh, more broadly, um, obviously, you know, for a long time in the Soviet Union, that whole pre-war history of the city would not have been something that you could talk about very open or discuss or research and so on. So there's a long period of uh, forgetting, I suppose, that has to be overcome. And that has been overcome, I think, in very interesting ways today in Ukraine, including with the festival, Meridian Chernovitz, um, which I know that you've been involved in. So perhaps you could tell us a bit about um, how that uh, the legacy of Ceylon or the other writers uh, from that region is being rediscovered uh, today in Ukraine. Uh, thank you, William. First of all, I would like to start with a very short introduction of uh, the poetess Rosa Auslander, whose name goes together with the name of Paul Celan when we talk about uh, um, uh, German uh, poetry, uh, German literature, um, written in um, the so-called Isle of Bukovina. Um, Rosa Oslander was uh, 19 years older than Paul Celan. She was born in 1901, um, but uh, fortunately they uh, met in life under the unfortunate circumstances of the uh, Chernovitz ghetto for the first time. Um, Rosa Auslander is a very good example of uh, the description of the of this historical multicultural background that, that uh, Gael just uh, gave us. Um, she was uh, coming from a, a Jewish family. Her father uh, grew up at the yard of a, a sad tzaddik, a Hasidic tzaddik in Sadagura, and her mother came uh, from um, a family of assimilated Jews from Berlin. So uh, Rosa was a German-speaking poet uh, who traveled uh, to the United States in 20s and 30s for economic reasons. And then she came back in uh, right before the Second World War uh, broke in and she got into um, the uh, Chernivtsi ghetto. Uh, and after the war, uh, through uh, friends with the help of uh, friends uh, um, from Bucharest and then in the States, she um, moved for good uh, to not for good but for a very long time to the united states and lived in new york um, for uh, more than 10 years and during this time she suddenly switched her writing language um, into english uh, which was an um, unconscious event uh, but uh, rather a consequence of uh, all this traumatic experience uh, of uh, the war of uh, losing her mother uh, whom she wanted but didn't manage to uh, to take with her to the state and after 10 years in uh, uh, 1957 she comes back to Europe she travels around Europe and she she meets with Salan in Europe, who uh, convinces Rosa to come back to writing in German, um, because uh, the poet, uh, any poet, lives in their own language. Um, but uh, I got interested and discovered this heritage of 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 Chernovitz, of Chernivtsi, of Bukovina, which is also uh, my personal heritage, the heritage of my family. Um, uh, coming from Bukovina and from Chernivtsi um, quite recently, I would say, because uh, my generation, we grew up in the world um, 
in the reality, which we now call post-Soviet. So we, our parents grew up and lived our entire life in the Soviet Union. And we, we did not live in the USSR, but we definitely uh, inherited the, the world, the reality of, uh, of uh, Western Ukraine, of our cities, of Chernivtsi, which was created by it. And um, um, I have uh, here a, a visual example of, uh, of uh, what I mean, what, how I um, would like to describe the um, discovery of, of this multicultural heritage of, through a literature and through poetry and uh, through uh, my work in the cultural sphere. Because uh, besides of being a poet, uh, professionally I define myself as a cultural manager. And um, cultural managers um, are also uh, quite creative um, people uh, who in fact create who act like like a glue they create experiences for other people uh, when they make festivals then they create platforms for the meeting and interaction between a, an artist a creator and uh, the audience and um, when i first uh, started working uh, for the international poetry festival in uh, chernivtsi i um, did not know too much about the a German literature of Chernitsi and about this multicultural heritage. Of course, uh, I knew back then that uh, Bukovina is um, very much a uh, Romanian region because of the proximity with the border and because of the historical uh, events. Um, every fifth person in this region is ethnic Romanian now at this point, um, but uh, to rediscover the uh, Jewish German speaking uh, world, it was a revelation. Um, so uh, at this picture, you can see um, a building which was known to my generation and generation of my parents uh, as a cinema theater. Uh, since 1992, it's um, called Chernivtsi, like the name of the city. Uh, but uh, during the Soviet times, it was called uh, um, the cinema of Zhovtin, October, October, dedicated to the um, uh, revolution, of course, Soviet revolution. And um, um, like you just see this cube square building, which is a cinema uh, and which is um, associated when you first look at it with some kind of Soviet uh, quasi Ampere style. Um, so one of the, I still think it's one of the best projects of the festival. It was, uh, I will remind you, it was 10 years ago, um, which I first coordinated and then became the executive director of this festival. Um, so one of the best projects and one of the most symbolic um, for me is this one. Uh, it, and it has to deal with this building. Um, so starting learning more about the Jew Jew Jewish heritage and this uh, uh, German uh, language uh, heritage uh, in the city where I uh, went to the same university uh, which uh, Salan attended and also studied philology and linguistics. Um, some, uh, sometimes in the streets, uh, if, you, if you just ask uh, an average person, uh, where is the university or what style was it built or what this building used to be? 10 years ago, there was no knowledge, no consciousness of the local people, the city dwellers of Chernivtsi, of um, where they live, why these streets look like they look, and uh, why Chernivtsi looks so much different than any other um, Ukrainian city. Uh, so, um, at those times, I discovered that this building used to look like this. Can we go to the next? Um, photo please in the presentation so it looks uh, it used to look like this and um, it was the famous uh, temple synagogue um, built at the end of the 19th century uh, by the famous architect uh, 
uh, from Lviv, um, Zaharevich, who, choose, uh, who chose uh, Mauritanian style to make this synagogue um, look um, more oriental. Um, if you look very carefully, you can find some uh, similarities in the shapes, uh, but it was uh, drastically changed. Um, during uh, this, the Second World War, uh, the fire burst out and uh, um, everything on the inside was uh, heavily um, destroyed. And in the 50s, a little bit later, the Soviets tried to um, to make an explosion to blow up the, what was remaining of, of the temple synagogue, uh, but they didn't manage to do it. Um, they only ruined the, the cupola and the, the walls. So they managed to stand and they are standing uh, till today. But um, this is the, 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 the next slide um, and we can move on to it now. Thank you. Um, and this is the, actually a very good example of what this, um, um, this work of uh, bringing cultural heritage and of culture management of uh, creating and curating uh, interesting projects which bring uh, the memory of entire societies back and um, so th this is how the result of the project looked and um, what you see is the light uh, projection visual projection of the um, Former look of the temple synagogue onto the real um, building of this cinema. It was on the first picture, and uh, uh, as far as I remember, we took these visuals from an institute of architecture in Jerusalem, uh, who kept the. Um, images of, of the temple and uh, I think they had kind of a 3D, um, a 3D pro uh, blueprint of it. Um, and uh, so we used very powerful projector to keep it like this for a few days of uh, the very first edition of the festival. And the effect um, was overwhelming, especially on those people who grew up next to the cinema who uh, were walking every day because this is the very center of the city who were walking um, past this building every day and had no idea that before it used to be a, a pearl of the uh, 19th uh, century architecture and, and a unique um, and a unique building. And uh, later with the uh, more editions of the festival uh, this um, uh, knowledge, this uh, consciousness and awareness of what the city was before the Soviet times. It uh, became um, almost tangible, as uh, Igor Pomeranze beautifully put it, that uh, the, the streets in this city started speaking again in, in multiple languages and um, German and Yiddish um, among them and the most loud. Uh, so um, yeah, this, this is uh, kind of a, a metaphor for me of uh, how this uh, history, this again, quoting Igor Pomerantsev, this Atlantis who went underwater is coming back again. Um, uh, so yeah, this is it for me for now. Hey, thank you so much. That, that was such an interesting, um kind of excursion into uh, Chernivtsi and uh, so fascinating to see the way that we can kind of uncover those different layers of that sort of palimpsestual past you know you, that you can really see when you go to these cities you can read it in the kind of urban fabric it's uh, and thankfully increasingly we do see these kind of projects uh, aimed at renovating or recovering or uh, speaking about them in some way so that was that was really fascinating um, and perfect uh, link into our final panelist, uh, Igor Pomerantsev, uh, who is, uh, who lived in Chernivtsi, who has written about Chernivtsi, uh, has written about uh, Paul Celan. Um, he's written, a, he, he wrote a wonderful book of essays um, on, which had, has the title Chernivtsi, Chernovtsi, Chernovitz, I believe, and uh, includes essays on the city and on his own experience of, of living there. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Igor, maybe 
to if you could speak about um, your relationship, maybe with your home city, but also with Paul Celan and how maybe your your own encounters with Paul Celan as a poet, as a poet yourself, um, as a poet who walked the same streets as Celan and was uh, kind of formed as a writer by the same urban environment in some ways, but in some ways a very different urban environment. Uh, hello, hello everybody. Vitaly Vilnishanovna Pansto. In a way, I'm here in our company, which is uh, very fr friendly uh, and enlightening for me. Um, I'm the only compatriot of Paul Celan. Uh, Irina Vakirchak said uh, that uh, Rosa Oslander was 19 years older than Paul Celan. And unfortunately, they met in ghetto. And I have a gap of age, 28 years old. So theoretically, if, again, unfortunately, Paul Solan would stay in Soviet Chernobyl, we could uh, know each other and poetry could connect us. Uh, I grew up in Chernovitz, in Chernivtsi, in the Soviet Chernivtsi, and me and my friends were mad about books, actually. It was the tradition which by air, you know, embedded in Chernovitz, although we mostly read in uh, Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, and in a way, we were bookworms and we read a lot, and we knew American literature, French literature, German, German contemporary literature, and classic literature. But we didn't know what kind of gold mine is under our feet. Nobody actually from my friends, and all of them were thirsty, eager to know everything. We, we dug out James Joyce published before the war uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. We dug out Marcel Proust, who was published 1933. Next, he was as if forgotten. But we didn't know this gold mine. We didn't know at all this oasis of culture and literature, which did exist between two world wars. Uh, unfortunately, first I heard the uh, name of Salam only in Kiev, because Kiev was the capital, and I was told first name by a great Ukrainian poet uh, encyclopedist, yes, uh, Mikola Bajan. But, but anyway, so my generation, we, we were strange barbarians. <laughs> we were barbarians who knew a lot, but who didn't know their ground their cultural ground, the language ground. Uh, I, I, I started from the fact that we could, uh, that I'm a competitor. I didn't think that we could meet each other. Look, in 1944, Ceylon started working at a, a kind of a Moldavian, Rumi, Romanian, uh, supplement of Ukrainian communist newspaper, Radenska Bukovina. It was called Zorile Bukovina, the dawn of Bukovina. So for a short period, he was involved in Soviet propaganda, actually. He translated this awful Soviet articles into Romanian. He did it in 1944. My father and my family were uh, settled in Chernobyl in 1953. And my father worked at uh, the Ukrainian <laughs> edition of Radyanska Bukovina, communist newspaper. So <laughs> theoretically, they did miss each other. Uh, Celan and my father, theoretically, he could, uh, there was a gap between uh, six, uh, three, nine years. Theoretically, uh, Salam could translate my, my father's bullshit, which my father wrote for communist newspaper. 
Uh, and the second fact, look, I uh, started my university uh, uh, years in 1965, and I entered the same faculty, uh, Roman Germanic faculty, we, where Tsuan studied. Moreover, he studied at English department there, where I did start. So I think that we were sitting, we used to sit in the same study rooms, <laughs> and as if we breathed the same air, academic dense air. So that's, that's made my attitude towards Paul Tulan almost, almost private. And uh, one more point, which is um, very important for me because I am grateful to the poet. Look, if we imagine Vitebsk, we, we don't see Vitebsk. We see only the flying Jews of Mark Chagall. If you visit Dublin, at every corner, you face quotation from Joyce's Ulysses. Even in Dragobich, you can identify places, Crocodile Street from Bruno Schulz. And Tsilan left us the city vacant. He almost didn't mention it, almost. Although uh, it uh, actually penetrated uh, his, his writing, this uh, channel, it's Meridian. But uh, he didn't leave any furniture, metaphorically speaking. He didn't leave even spots of uh, sweat, of blood in his poems in Chernobyl. So as if he made the place vacant for coming poets and writers. And uh, in a way, uh, for many years, uh, I used to live in young years and student years in Chernovitz, but, and left Chernovitz forever. Although I, I live presently in Prague. Uh, so I, I'm still in the uh, magnetic field of uh, uh, Austrian Empire, Habsburg Empire. But, but any, any, anyway, um, I, I, I feel uh, myself, I, I, I feel the city as if generously left by Paul Tselan. And it's a kind of lesson. I do write about Chernovitz, but I try to do it tactfully, you know, not to eclipse. Uh, the great uh, writers and geniuses of Chernovitz who used to live there between two world wars. Thank you. Possibly I will be back and speak a bit more about poetry of Tsalan, if we have time. Absolutely, uh, we, we definitely will. Thank you so much uh, for, for, that, uh, for that kind of personal perspective on, uh, on the city and on Tsalan itself. Um, and absolutely, I think now we should turn to Ceylan's uh, poetry itself and hear some of it. Um, we do have a recording of a poem uh, by Ceylan called Sam. Uh, this is from a 1963 uh, collection called Neman's Hose, uh, translated as No One's Rose. Um, I would say much about uh, the poem. I think Ceylan's poems have to be left to stand for themselves and speak for themselves, but clearly we can see here, as in many of his poems, there is a, a kind of oblique reference to the Holocaust, to the destruction of human life in the Holocaust, uh, through a very powerful kind of religious or theological even uh, lens. So we have the three, uh, three versions of this poem. We have the original uh, in German and we have the translation by Petro Rychlo into Ukrainian and we have Michael Hamburger's translation into English. So I think now we're going to hear uh, Paul Celan's own voice reading uh, his German original. Psalm. Niemand knetet uns wieder aus Erde und Lehm. Niemand bespricht unseren Staub. Niemand. 
gelobt seist du niemand. Dir zulieb wollen wir blühen, dir entgegen. Ein Nichts waren wir, sind wir, werden wir bleiben blühend, die Nichts, die Niemandsrose. Mit dem Griffel Seelen hell, dem Staubfaden Himmelswüst, der Krone rot vom Purpurwort, das wir sangen, über, o oh, über dem Dorn. Okay. Um, and now we will turn to Irina, who has volunteered to read the Ukrainian translation. Переклад Петра Рихло. Салом. Ніхто нас не виліпить знову із глини земної. Ніхто не оплаче наш прах. Ніхто. Будь славен на віки, ніхто. За для тебе ми квітним. Супроти тебе. Ніщо. Ми були, є і буде квітуючи. Троянда ніщо, нічийна троянда. З маточкою світлої душі, тичинкою небесної пустелі, келихом, що палає від пурпурових слів, які ми співали понад. О, понад тернім. Thank you. Thank you for reading that uh, beautiful translation so, so beautifully. Um, the, finally, the English translation, I read myself, translation by Michael Hamburger, Psalm. No one molds us again out of earth and clay. No one conjures our dust. No one. Praised be your name, no one. For your sake, we shall flower towards you. A nothing we were, are, shall remain, flowering. The nothing, the no one's rose. With our pistil soul bright, with our stamen heaven ravaged, our corolla red, with the crimson words which we sang over, o oh, over, the thorn. Okay, so a small taste of uh, Paul Silan's uh, poetry. And before we go to the general discussion and ask for your questions, um, I would just like to ask our panelists how they might uh, respond very briefly to that uh, poem that we've just read. And I know that Igor, you wanted to say a couple of words about Paul Silan's poetry. Uh, what I especially uh, loved Silan's poetry those uh, gaps, ellipses, um, and pauses between words and, uh, um, and sentences, actually, uh, theoretically, one could put it on the shelf with French surrealists. But I think that the origin of those gaps, pauses, hard breath is uh, different. Simply, he was on the brink of death. Ferenc died. And so his lines go as if between the heart beating. That's why they, they are as if broken, as if torn out. And uh, one, 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 one more point. Uh, in every language, uh, almost in every, at least in English, there is a phrase to swallow one's tongue. Uh, in Ukrainian, it's prokofnutiv uh, yezeka. And it was a, a kind of phenomenon. Uh, another, another Chernovitz writer, Aaron Appelfeld, he survived by miracle during the war. And uh, after the war, in the end of war, he was in Italy, in Rome, as a very young man. 
uh, and he wrote autobiographical novel and he writes that he lost his uh, ability to speak. For some months, he was silent, absolutely silent. And I think the same phenomenon we could find in Tzalan's poetry as if he as well swallowed his tongue and the work of taking back, finding back his tongue and physical sense in his mouth, that was the core of his poetry. That's why it's a bit, it's broken, torn. And one last point, uh, Jacques Derrida, French philosopher, knew personally Paul Salah, they worked together at the same normal school. Yeah, it's one of the most prestigious, by the way, institution uh, in France. And th they met from time to time. And he, he uh, wrote memoirs and he wrote a kind of shibalet. Shibalet is his essay about Salan, study about Salan, and memoirs at the same time. And he writes that as if uh, making stitches, uh, you know, uh, in the language. Tzalan was trying to make his shibboleth, yeah, that he belongs to the language. I would go hypothetically even further. I have the feeling that Tzalan, in a way, sometimes wanted to hurt the German language. In a way, it could be his psychological revenge. This is my hypothesis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A really uh, provocative and interesting thought there, but yes, absolutely. You know, this crisis, post-Holocaust crisis of the language, is certainly one of the, the central problems uh, when we talk about Silan's work. Um, I wondered if, if anyone else had anything, any responses to the poem you might like, like to add, just very briefly, because we, we're kind of running short of time. We need to turn to our audience. Okay, um, we will turn to our audience and we have a question from uh, uh, Orissa Martiuk. It's interesting. Uh, it's a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. Everybody contributes from a perspective which is uh, unknown to me. Also, uh, my memories with to Paul Silan go back to my school years. And um, in a way, it's it's quite it's quite the opposite of what uh, Igor Pomerantsev said that he lived in this place and didn't know of Paul Celan. I lived in Munich and we studied Celan in school in the early 70s and of course Todesfuge and that was sort of part of the curriculum which we which we uh, learned by heart even I think I mean because for some reason all these texts come back to me. So it, that's that's quite that's quite a um, quite a sort of uh, bizarre sort of uh, different um, as accent uh, on 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 his life. I think it's also what what's what what I remember from my school is that he gave back. You know, the, the question was how can you write literature after the Shoah after after Holocaust? How can you write? And um, I seem to remember that that we that. Paul Celan gave back the German language. He, he, he allowed German language to be a proper, true expression of, of thoughts again after, after, this, this, after this disaster. Of course, it, it was helped presumably with, about, with his relationship with the world of literature in Europe as Ingemar Bachmann and, and Max Frisch and the French one I'm not so familiar with, excuse me. Surely he was he was very well connected uh, through his, well, as an intellectual anyway, but also through his marriage to his, his wife. But um, it was very, very, you know, 1970s, uh, we just had 1968, this the sort of big rebellion and this big uh, social and intellectual um, change in, 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 in Western Europe, he was already part of the curriculum, which I think is quite, was quite shocking then. But now with hearing what we discussed today, it makes it even more impressive that how Germany embraced 
um, that history. Let's put it mildly. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, for that comment. And um, I wonder, maybe this is somewhere where we could come back to uh, Anya or maybe Gail about um, Celan's uh, existence, the existence of his work in Germany in that period that uh, uh, after the war. Um, I know that you know. On the one hand, as as Orisia said, his uh, his work certainly become they become canonical texts. Uh, in many ways, but that relationship was not always easy, I don't think, with the German reading public, with the German critics. There was maybe certain tensions, certain controversies around uh, certain aspects of his work, and I wondered maybe if you could um, say a few words about that. Um, yeah, perhaps I can quickly say something about a poem which you mentioned, Uliam, or uh, a few of us mentioned already, the the, um, his iconic poem, um, Todesfuge, and the Death Fuge, and which was indeed really, um, yeah, it was quite problematic. And at points, Celan himself started to distance himself, even though it wasn't, that, that wasn't, yeah, quite, he, he was quite, um, I guess, he, he described his relationship or the relationship to the German public, to the poem as, as one of a history of misconception and misreading. And, and he was even, it was a history also which, which included anti-Semitic attacks um, when he was reading for, for the um, Gruppe 45 um, in Germany. And, and I think what's at, at the bottom of this is that he, his lo loyalty was to the German language and not to Germany as a country. And he very rarely um, traveled to Germany himself. But um, I think he was very critical of, of the way this poem was um, received um, and that it was actually incorporated into textbooks and that it was a quite prescriptive reading of the poem, which didn't actually take stock or account of, of this way where he tried to undermine traditions. And, and of course, it's, it's difficult to, to teach that in, in school. And, um, but, but I think it was at this point when, when, his, po when, when his poetry and his poetics um, became more radical. And there was a kind of radicalization of, of his poetics, um, which, which happened because he, and which in turn then, then for, following on from this, what happened then was that um, he was accused of, of hermetic, hermeticism, that hermetic poetry, which, which he countered by saying, no, my, my poetry is not hermetic. It, it has a really strong relationship to, to reality, but in a way his poems were really precise in that it, it really, and I said that before, that it, it tried to actualize or, or yeah, to bring up the meaning of a word and, and its really depth and, and its etymology. Now, I stop here, but perhaps you can, yeah, field some other questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we might have another question ready. Okay, we have a question uh, from uh, Bogdan Pechenyak, who's uh, put his question into the Q&A, which I obviously encourage all of our um participants to do um two questions here i think very interesting questions so number one is could one of the panelists speak about the history of translation of paul Celan's poetry into ukraine into ukrainian um so i think a great question we already mentioned Mikola bajan uh who certainly must have been one of the first to translate Celan. but we know that Vasil Stus translated Celan and read Celan and knew his work but we, we have more recent very interesting translations as well whose translation we read, Serhij Alan, also one of the most famous contemporary poets, has uh, translated Selan's work. So that, that's a great question. Uh, and the second one is about how Paul Selan's poetry and experience uh, can be related to the experience of marginalized peoples in today's world. For example, the Uyghurs in China, uh, the Rohingya in, in Myanmar, 
uh, etc basically to those groups beyond Europe so this is a very interesting question you know but Simon's poetry obviously very much rooted in that great sort of European trauma and tragedy of the Holocaust but can it can it have a wider uh, resonance which I, I dare say that it can um, but I would maybe we can go to this question of translation and that might be a question for Irina possibly or, or for Igor. Yeah, I would like to add something because you um, generally describe the situation with translations very well, but uh, uh, yeah, it, I, I found that uh, it started mainly in the um, uh, 80s or 1978 to be precise with the publication in, in the um, magazine. Uh, back then it was an uh, important literary magazine, Sesvit, uh, and these were the translations by Mikola Bajan, Mark Belorusset, uh, Moise Fishbane and others. And uh, at the moment, of course, the most important uh, person who is uh, also responsible for discovering Paul Salan's poetry for the Ukrainian reader is uh, Petro Rychlo, uh, who um, a few years ago um, decided to start translating all Ceylon's poetry in chronological order. And uh, this looks uh, like a book series. It's a bilingual uh, poetry book series uh, published in uh, um, uh, Books 21, uh, 21 uh, Publishing House, which is based in Chernivtsi, um, Barcelona's uh, city. And uh, also Petrarchal translated um, other books related to Ceylon, for example, correspondence between uh, Ceylon and Ingeborg Bachmann. Uh, they did this translation together with Larissa Tsubenko, who translated the part of um, Ingeborg Bachmann. And uh, of course, uh, contemporary uh, writers such as Sergei Jadan, uh, and um, uh, I think Tanya Malerchuk, they also um, translate uh, Salon's poetry uh, in, in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, maybe just leading, leading on for that, would, would you say that there's um, maybe a, a kind of delayed influence of Paul Salon on contemporary Ukrainian literature? Because you, you mentioned Jagan and also uh, Malerchuk, but you know, if you if you look around recently in the Ukrainian uh, on the internet, you can see lots of writers who are um, speaking on Pausilan or writing essays on Pausilan. It seems like he's a he's a name who's in in the minds of lots of contemporary Ukrainian writers. Um, yes, and uh, it's uh, a great uh, deal. Um, the result of uh, this uh, huge. Um, promotion, uh, finally, Salon, finally Salon is in the spotlight. So um, thanks to, to, to Meridian Chernovitz um, and also thanks to the general situation in the literary process of Ukraine, which allows uh, the um, contemporary writers uh, to uh, connect with other writers and festivals and go uh, to the residences abroad or to live as expats um, uh, abroad in uh, German speaking countries and also be able to read Salon in original and uh, and uh, talk about him and translate him his poetry into Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, I would turn maybe to the second question now and uh, so this question of how Ceylon's poetry speaks to the experience of marginalized people, uh, maybe just beyond the immediate context that produced his work. Um, I mean, and speaking about maybe minorities and the, the plight of minorities, uh, maybe this is a, an opportunity to bring Gael back in, um, you know, because you, you discussed the way that Ceylon uh, was produced by this, this situation in which basically we had all the very minorities in this kind of quite difficult uh, history of their, their coexistence in many ways. And also obviously the, the history of the Holocaust, which was uh, certainly about that victimization of a, of a minority and a marginalized people. So I wonder uh, what you would say to that question of the maybe broader relevance of his work in that sense. Yeah, I, I can't speak so much about the poetry as such, but I could say that, I mean, the fact that he um, was a poet and, and has thereby reached so many more people than, than he 
would without this art. Um, this makes his experience obviously relevant uh, far beyond his own narrow group of experience, but also beyond his his region um, and so on. So I think that he's he's the artistic contribution is is key to to also making this experience more relatable. Um, but about his literal experiences, so his his trajectory and what he went through, I think there's a lot of um, I mean, many of the unfortunate uh, experiences he made, including, of course, genocide, but also um, displacement and um, this sort of the, the collapse of, of state structures, um, making people very vulnerable because they uh, the, the system disappears and, and then the individual is not um, empowered anymore to to seek to seek or no, no longer entitled to security or citizenship, so these are things that are obviously universal problems. Um, and I think um, what is also interesting in the case of uh, Bukovina and in his um, life experiences is also the the issue that societies face uh, when confronted with difference and uh, how to sort of. Of course, it's interesting if you look at Bukovina from uh, today's standpoint and, and with the sort of memory culture, we are fascinated by, by this, um, by the multi-ethnicity multi and by, by, by the productivity and the, the sort of um, the, the treasure of like people coming together with different experiences and backgrounds. But of course, this has in history often been the source of incredible tensions and terrible things. And this is, uh, unfortunately the case around the world. So I think his story, if we hear it and if we emphasize, empathize with what he went through, then I think it can really speak to many other groups and situations. Um, and that's why I think it's also an important story to, to become acquainted with, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that we, we mentioned earlier how Ceylon's work really lends itself to, you know, elaboration, maybe in other forms of, of, of art even, but I think it, it, it does have that quality that allows it to really transcend its immediate context um, uh, and be understood in many different ways, I think in, in different contexts potentially. Um, I think on, on a, a kind of related note, I wanted to come back to a name that we've mentioned already, and that was the name of Nicola Bajan, who um, translated Ceylon into Ukrainian, but it was also um, shared with Salan uh, uh, an attention to the Holocaust in his work. Um, he was one of the first, I guess, one of the first European writers really to write about the Holocaust very, very soon after um, the events themselves. And he wrote <coughs> very famously about Babinyar, about the massacre of uh, Jews in Kiev. Um, and I imagine that that was certainly one of the things that interested uh, that made Ceylon's work interesting for him. Uh, and I wonder maybe whether um, Igor or Irina would like to, uh, would be able to speak to that, uh, the interest in of Nikola Bajan or maybe other Ukrainian writers in this topic of the Holocaust, which after all was something which really affected the territories of Ukraine in, in a huge way. I don't know, uh, Irina? Uh Go, go ahead. Uh, okay. Actually, I left Chernobyl, Chernobyl for Kiev in 1972. And in a couple of years already, I was introduced to Nikola Bajan by my compatriot, Ulysses Yuzhdin. And thanks to this meeting, I first heard the name of uh, Paul Salam. It means that still, although Kiev in comparison with Moscow was a kind of provincial capital, but still personally Nikola Bajan, who was by the way the um, editor uh, and, and the kind of manager of Ukrainian encyclopedia, and not by chance. His knowledge was encyclopedia, and Salam was in his memory, and he, Kiev, writer told me, chairman is young poet, about Paul Salan. This is, this is the paradox. Um, and, and anyway, uh, yes, Bajan touched and was personally touched by the um, tragedy of Holocaust. 
He has, by the way, a, a poem, a very strong poem about Holocaust. But in the Soviet Union, generally, uh, the word Jew in Russia was almost, almost forbidden. Uh, you, you couldn't listen, you couldn't hear this word Jew, Yedrei, in Russian television. So all the efforts of Bajan, and some most Ehrenburg, Moscow writers, to declare the fact of Holocaust, to uh, focus the attention on it, were absolutely dismissed. And even at Babi Yar, the tragedy where mostly Jews, not only Jews, but mostly Jews perished, there was a kind of plague that here the Soviet people were <laughs> annihilated, killed. So, uh, so it came back to Bajan already later, yes, to, 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 to make translations from Paul Tzlan when it was more or less, it was not Stalin's time, it was Brezhnev's time, I think, yeah, it was Brezhnev's time. So it, it was uh, possible. So every step uh, of uh, naming, uh, uh, naming Paul Tzalan as a great poet was a kind of heroic effort. It's, it, it has nothing to do with literature. It has something to do with uh, uh, dictatorial regimes. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Irina, did you want to add something to that? Uh, yes, but uh, actually I would like to go back to this question about the, how we can relate Salan's life experience with the, the, with the experience of the uh, oppressed minorities uh, in the world. Um, but I would like to bring that question to the context of Ukraine, because um, um for some reason I, I i just like feel that it's more relevant uh, to make this parallel with the experience of the crimean tatar minority in ukraine and on the annexed uh, crimean peninsula um i would like to uh, give a very quick example from my own experience. In 2015, I was um, org organizing and curating together with my colleagues from Vinnytsia and a new, um, a new literature festival in central Ukraine, um, which was actually focused on the genre of short story, but uh, the aim, uh, the, the, the theme, it was the literature of uh, uh, national minorities uh, which live on the territory of Ukraine. And uh, it was like a year after Maidan and, you know, the awakening of the social consciousness and uh, um, civil, or civil consciousness and so on. And um, uh, I was very surprised to discover that, um, I mean, I knew that before, but when I met these people in person, it was quite a new experience that uh, we had uh, the Ukrainian writers writing in Hungarian, for example, from the Carpathia region, that um, we had uh, um, writers uh, creating their works in uh, Crimean Tatar language, uh, who are Ukrainian writers. Um, we had also Rus uh, writers writing in Russian, but who consider themselves Ukrainian Russian uh, writers. Uh, we even had, uh, I think, somebody writing in Bulgarian, who was also a Ukrainian writer, but writing in different languages. And this phenomenon of German Bukovinian literature and the fact that we speak about uh, Salan so much these days, it's just uh, also another very strong uh, component to this mosaic and this puzzle of um, uh, the very multinational uh, country which Ukraine is. We have, uh, I think it, the number is 127 or 120, uh, 30 national minorities that are living in Ukraine and uh, there are, uh, and they are also creating um, like Ukrainian literature in their national languages. So, so this is kind of a contemporary context. Okay, thank you. Such a, this is really such an important point, I think, um, and and probably a good moment for us to bring our discussion to a close because unfortunately we've reached the, the time limit. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely. You know, we we started off talking about the many faces of Ukraine, and and we're talking about figures from from the past, cultural figures from the, from the past. But of course, 
Ukraine today, uh, as Irina has, has uh, just outlined, has also has many faces and many languages uh, and, and is a very diverse uh, place. 